Hi everyone, my name's Elizabeth, I'm a marine biologist and today I will be starting my new nature journal by painting a page all about the wonderful ecosystem of rock pools with a few surprises. Today you're not just going to see me paint this journal page but also learn a ton of weird wonderful facts that you didn't know you needed but you definitely do uh, <laughs> about this amazing ecosystem, about how it helps us about how these weird creatures adapt to live in an environment where they're covered in water part of the time and out in the air for the rest of it. So stay tuned. So this is a new sketchbook. Savor the moment. This is a blue moleskin sketchbook uh, in the size of large. I'm obsessed with moleskin notebooks, sketchbooks, they're amazing. <laughs> I highly recommend this as a sketchbook if you want it, they're really durable, the paper is great for acrylic and watercolour, they even have a watercolour sketchbook which is better, so check that out if you want a nice example for a good nature journal. Before we get into the main part of this video, I just want to say that I produce weekly content all about the wonderful and weird ocean and as part of that I have a series called Sea Life Sketchbook Sessions where we basically paint pages like this and talk about weird facts too. So I'll link the playlist up here so if you want to check that out then go and check the rest of those videos out but also subscribe to make sure you're staying up to date with all of the awesome videos I'm producing each week and so that you can amaze your friends with weird and wonderful ocean facts. So the Rocky Shore is a great ecosystem full of literally thousands of different species. Now, I'm not going to be able to draw thousands of different species. I could probably fill about 100 moleskin notebooks with all the information that I wish I could tell you. But today we are going to be narrowing down our focus and focusing on one rock pool within the mid shore. So Rocky Shores are kind of defined at, by the tide and by the sea. So they're split into kind of roughly five zones. The zone right at the top that just gets splashed with seawater uh, and doesn't really ever get covered. Then right at the top we have the upper shore where that um, is out of the sea most of the time. But the sea only covers it for a few hours a day when it's right at high tide. The mid shore which makes up most of it which is kind of equally both in water and out of water for equal amount of time. The lower shore, which is then basically only ever exposed to air for a few hours when the tide is at its lowest, and then after that you kind of get into just the zone which is the, the rest of the ocean where it is basically covered all of the time. And because it, this, you know, being exposed to air is a really big deal and uh, really makes a difference, to live in each of the different zones, species have had to adapt to cope with these conditions. So we're going to focus on the midshore, which is both equally in and out of water, and look at what grows, or you could find if you looked in a rock pool. So I'm going to start drawing this page for the Nature Journal, and we're going to make it exciting. It's not just going to be, you know, a painted page two. We are going to introduce flaps of paper to add excitement. A great way to, um, I, I want to make this page fun. All my videos are about fun and engaging and entertaining and I want my journal pages to be the same. And I don't know about you, but I love books as a kid when you would read this thing and it would be like, oh, what's under here? And you would kind of investigate within a book. And just a simple kind of flap of paper really, uh, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the interactive kind of content and the fact that you'd be surprised by what is on the other side, which is often how I feel when I go rock pooling. So why not put that in a journal? I know, I'm also easily pleased, but what can you do? <laughs> so I'm going to be using the, uh, I'm, so I'm gonna be using printer paper. It's premium printer paper. I would use watercolor paper, but um, I don't know how it's gonna fold into the journal but we're going to use it to kind of describe what grows on rocks so not only on the actual rocky shore itself and in the rock pools but there are rocks that have been moved and transported by the tide and storms and stuff that rock pooling creatures grow and live on and that in itself what grows on the top what grows on the bottom what kind of grows in the crevices 
can be different. Species live, uh, certain species live on the bottom, different species live on the top because there's different conditions like light and, and uh, protection and kind of size and space. So I'm going to talk about that too. And uh, it's a really just a thing if you're doing some nature journey, just consider could you make some layers. I'll reveal what the flaps look like as the video goes along and at the end. But for now, let's get on with the serious painting. about the rocky shore is the colours. People think that marine life is kind of either tropical and brightly coloured and amazing or sludgy grey and gross in the UK. It's not the case. There are multicoloured species galore, okay maybe not as much as the tropics, but great coloured species. We've got browns and greens and reds and purples all just within the seaweeds. We've got something called uh, coral weed, which is an amazing uh, seaweed because like coral, like coral reef coral, um, it forms a calcium carbonate skeleton. So when you touch it, it feels hard because you know nothing's gonna wanna eat rock basically. And it's a really good mechanism, but it's also bright pink and bright purple. And similar to that, a bright pink and bright purple seaweed is Crosso's coralline algae, which grows along the surface, turning whole rocks in this gorgeous kind of purple colour. And as well, well, as well as all these colours that you can find within the seaweeds, seaweeds themselves are incredibly important, not just within this ecosystem, um, but for the planet. Um, they can actually take in 20 times more carbon than a land forest. And I love it when marine biologists decide that, you know, things like seaweed and kelp forests are forests and that the forests we would call forests are land forests. I love that so much. So 20 times more carbon than land forests. And this is just one of the reasons that people, I, I shout every week into camera being like, let's love our rocky shores because this is a place, a nursery ground. It's a, a place where seaweeds and this ecosystem thrives and it it's helping the planet itself. It's an amazing, amazing resource and it's really, really underestimated because again, it might not be like the tropics, it might not be different colour, you know, as many colours, but it's still colourful. And if I can tell people that it's colourful and you should get there for because it looks pretty, if I can get you there for that very fact, then I'm gonna use that to also, you know, help protect it, help show you that this ecosystem is really making a difference to so much of our ocean wildlife that we just need to enjoy, appreciate and protect it. And I love it so much. <gasps> so now let's break down each individual species. I'll show you some footage if I've seen them in the wild. I'll show you me painting them and tell you weird and wonderful facts about each of them. And then I'm gonna save kind of the final reveal of what the whole entire nature journal spread looks like until the end. are always a fantastic find on the rocky shore. Something about them being star-shaped always captures the hearts of us as children and well into adults too. But wherever you find starfish you're also going to find mussels and because that's because that's their, their favourite food. Starfish eat mussels and they eat it in a really super gross way. They use their really big strong arms to go over the mussel and the mussel is really strong and clasped together and you know, ah oh, don't eat me and they will pull apart just a little bit, the, the mussel is just a little bit, they manage to get it open and they will inject their stomach through this tiny gap, dissolve the mussel with their stomachy enzymes 
and then slurp it all back out. So I thought, I thought I'd share that with you. So if you want to find starfish, despite their evil ways, go and find a beach with some mussels on and you've got a good chance. Now I have also filmed a video totally on this, explaining more about it, doing a sketchbook page, and in fact, almost every single species I'm including in this video, I have a whole separate video, all explaining way more about that species, showing more footage, more information. So what I'm gonna do, instead of at the end of every single fact I give, I'm just gonna put at the bottom of the video, under in the description, a list of all of the species we draw and talk about in today's video, with a link to the video on my channel that I think best explains more about that. So if you want footage to draw from, if you want more facts, if you want to know, then here is an easy list for you to fall down the YouTube rabbit hole. Joy, that wasn't so creepy. Crabs are one of my favourite creatures on the entire planet. They are awesome, they are small, and they are feisty. And you find a lot of different species of crab on a rocky shore. And they have to live within close quarters of each other. They're all quite big personalities. And to do that, they kind of have to live in different lives, different lives, different ways. So you'll find the behaviours of different crabs, they act differently so that they kind of don't get in each other's way as much. And so you often find common shore crabs which are the most common crab on the shore in the UK. Uh, they have really good agile moving legs that kind of blend in with the, uh, their brown and greeny coloration. And they scuttle about like nobody's business. Or you can find them under rocks, kind of buried in the sand with just their little eyes poking out, or even not even that, kind of waiting out if they don't want to be so active, they can kind of bury themselves away when they need, you know, some time to themselves. But most of the time you just find them running around like energetic, little, aggressive, amazing creatures. So you often find that edible crab acts a lot differently. This is a big armoured crab and it knows that it's kind of got the power and the protection to just not risk running around, it can just stay there. And if a predator comes along, it kind of acts like a pebble and says, you know, I don't think you're going to get me even if you try, so I'm just going to stay here, stay quiet and stay out of the way. So if you lift up rocks, what you think is a pebble is often going to be an edible crab. It kind of tucks itself in and stands there. And even if you held it in your hand, which again, you will see in other videos, it doesn't really do much. It won't really bite you or pinch you or uh, it will just kind of sit there really passively. And again, this is another ecosystem service because these tiny edible crabs on the rocky shore, you don't find them much bigger than that. Most of the time they're a lot smaller. And these crabs can get this big. They're the crabs you eat. Uh, when you eat crab, you know, edible crab. And right here on the rocky shore is the nursery for these creatures, which is incredible that protecting this resource and ecosystem, if you're a fan of crab, is protecting your nice food, but it's also protecting kind of like the livelihood of a lot of people and another nutritious resource that the sea gives us. Now, sponges are really cool. I know that every sponge you see is a disappointment compared to the very famous SpongeBob, but he a list celebrity sponge. But normal everyday sponges are actually really awesome because they were pretty much the first animals to ever evolve on the planet. They are way back in the beginning. And as amazing as that is to be the first kind of animal to come into existence, they're still here. You can still see them right on the rocky shore and in tons of weird and great colours. The breadcrumb sponge, which is a common sea, uh, common sponge in the UK, comes in, think, in different colours from bright orange to bright green to bright purple. And it loves to live in the cracks and crevices within uh, the rocks. So if you're walking along and you just kind of see these gleams and glares of, of you know, different colour in the cracks and it's a really cool uh, little find. But what is extra incredible about the fact that you find sponges, the first animals to live on the planet, is that you also find sea squirts. Now these love to live on overhangs or under rocks or places like that. But these are the last ver invertebrates, the last things without a backbone to evolve before we got creatures with backbones. And actually if you dissect and look inside of a sea squirt, it has something called a notochord, which is a 
a preliminary spine. It's the thing that comes before the spine. And together, within centimeters of each other, the first ever animal, the first ever invertebrate to evolve, and the last live in exactly the same ecosystem. Pepper dogs is one of the seaweeds on the rocky shore that is actually edible and there are quite a few. If you pick this seaweed up and when you're out rock pulling you can actually eat it. It is an acquired taste, very bitter, very irony, but a lot of the seaweeds you can actually take and dry and then use it as some sort of seasoning in food. And in fact they're really nutritious and it is a great kind of ecosystem service that we can get from the rocky shore is food and nutrition and you can eat them. It always makes me laugh as well that it is peppery kind of tasting and that the sea is salty so you know the sea's got itself covered for seasoning. It's a seasoning itself. Weird. Fasciculosis is known as bladder rack. On the rocky shore, it is common as pretty much grasses in a forest. It's definitely there, surrounded by other species. Um, it really, it's the staple. It's the one that I don't think I've ever gone to a rocky shore and not found somewhere. There are lots of different types of fucus, but this one is called bladder rack because it has these little yellow bladders that when the sea comes in, lifts up the um, the seaweed so that it floats in the water upright and you know gets as much sunlight on it as possible and on these little uh on this on these seaweeds in particular fucuses and particularly bladder rack you'll often find flat periwinkles there are a lot of periwinkles and a lot of tiny snails um on the shore each have its own little niche but flat periwinkles are cute and charismatic and their name really just shows that their shell instead of going pointy kind of stays as this little round shell without a point and they're often bright yellow which is really awesome and you think why would something be bright yellow surely that stands out a million miles on the shore well actually it kind of replicates those bladders which is why you find it particularly on fucus because they just look like those yellow bladders from that seaweed and the reason that they can live in the fucus in the seaweed so much is that when the tide goes out you know, the one thing that's going to really kill these creatures is uh, being dried out and seaweeds hold a lot of moisture so they can live and move around in the seaweed while the tide's out and not, you know, dry out completely and that's a really good adaptation for them. I will just mention that I have my own documentary series called When the Tide Retreats and I have a whole documentary episode on how species adapt to living at different levels of the shore in really a lot of detail so if you want to know more about that and watch that documentary episode it is linked here. Now finding a green blob on the rocky shore probably isn't that uncommon. There are a lot of blobby things and green tends to be a regular colour but in particular this kind of green blob has always been a mystery to me and was one of the first mysteries that I solved using my Marine Mumbles uh, platform. And uh, other people knew this, I just didn't know. I didn't discover this fact, but it's always amazed me and has been one of the great things of social media and sharing and talking. So if you've got any questions and comments, you know, put them below. Let's start up a conversation because amazing facts like these kind of come to the surface and I just want to hear more. So this green blob is about this size and it looks like something that should be I suppose what you think a fish egg would look like. And for ages I couldn't work out what it was because I found them on sandy shores, I found them on rocky shores, and there wasn't really any explanation I could find. So I asked the internet and the internet returned and said that it was the 
eggs of a green leaf worm. And I looked up the green leaf worm and thought, well, okay, that sounds okay. But I didn't really grasp the size of the worm. It's very difficult when it's not next to stuff. It was just like, oh, okay, it sounds a bit weird, but I obviously I believe you and I get it and the ocean does weird stuff. But then I found it years later, I actually saw a green leaf worm um, laying its eggs, which I filmed, and again, links are below. And it was incredible because the size of the egg is about this big, but the worm is teeny weeny, probably like 10 times smaller than the eggs that it lays in the sack. And it was a incredible and great experience to see that worm working so hard to lay so many eggs and kind of wrap it and protect it. And that was, uh, it was really cool. There are a lot of things that you can find specifically on the bottom of rocks. It's why people go and turn over rocks a lot when they're rock pooling. Again, a reminder, if you turn over a rock, you should always put it back because the things that live on the bottom are different to the top. Now, what I have found that you often find at the bottom of, uh, or on the bottom of rocks are really cool, really weird and really varied things. And one of the things you wouldn't expect to kind of always find under rocks or on the bottom of rocks is a scorpion fish. What is a scorpion fish? That sounds amazing. Well, they are. They're really like, look armoured and, and like, you know, sturdy and like they're not going to go anywhere. And it's kind of how they act. I've picked up a lot of rocks and you genuinely can't see them because they have such good camouflage. They're blending in so well at the bottom of the rock. And because they're quite stocky and I, they just, they're able to stay on the bottom. Um, because they've blended in so well, I imagine that they just think like, ah, I'll be fine, she won't see me. And it means you can get some really cool close-up footage and they're really gorgeous. type of kind of star shaped thing that is on uh, the sea on rocky shores they're like starfish but not quite the same and they're the second part of the latin name is fragilis because you shouldn't really touch these species because if you touch them they break apart and that's a kind of defense mechanism something that means that um you know they can kind of get away but they are just really fragile they they kind of feel like they're made of I wouldn't even say glass because glass is way more fragile. Like paper mache in the sea, which makes no sense, but uh, they are. But they're also really beautiful. They come in loads of different patterns. And if you're on a beach that has these brittle stars, you'll probably find hundreds of them or you won't find any. Um, and especially the little baby ones are so cute. Flatfish, they are evolutionary miracles. I've spoken about it in a video. They are blooming amazing. Um, and they also have this amazing Crypsis, which is camouflage, but when you don't actually change. Crypsis is when, so Crypsis is when you kind of change your body to fit the environment, but that's kind of what you are forever. Whereas camouflage is more changeable. Uh, anyway, great. It, it blends in. The only time you will see a flatfish is if you see a bit of sand moving and you think. That's you know too many pieces of sand to be moving together, and then you s realise it's a fish. Uh, again, rocky shores are great juvenile nurseries for these fish, and things like turbot, which are absolutely huge, one of the biggest fish you can ever get in the sea, and they are juveniles. You can see on the rocky shore that are this big when they, you know, meters big, massive fish. So <laughs> again, incredible encounters, and all you need to do is put on wellies for them. I mean, why are people not rock pulling all of the time? Amphipods you can find on the rocky shore. They probably freak people out quite a lot. They're small, jumpy, and look a bit like aliens. And in fact, uh, for me, they are a bit of a bugbear because to ID them is the most tedious thing. I've spent too many hours of my life trying to ID them by counting the leg hairs of them. Anyway. Uh, 
but I wanted to include them because you often find them on the bottom of rocks, you often find them breeding on the bottom of rocks at certain times of year, and you can find hundreds of them. And these are, uh, I suppose, the only way, you'll probably know them maybe of two ways. One is sand hoppers, which live on the strand line, you just see these little bugs jumping around on the washed up seaweed. That's sand hoppers and that's a type of amphipod. And you'll also know them if you've been in the sea and you kind of come out and been bitten, a bit like a, a gnat bite or something, um, but maybe more vicious when they bite you. And that's actually because some of these, these species uh, can bite you and it's not, not the nicest. They're not my favorite. <laughs> but I can't be positive about them all. <laughs> I love me a limpet. A limpet is basically a living rock. No, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a type of snail in um, in a shell, and it has a ton of weird and different facts, which I film videos about. They're really really cool, um, and they leave this trail of of marks on the surface of the rocks, little teeth scrapers because it eats something called biofilm which you can't see with your eyes but if you got a really powerful microscope and wiped a bit of the surface of a rock and put it under you would find these amazing glass structures with living living cells inside that form all these different patterns and that's diatoms and all these microorganisms and they kind of release um, a lot of nutrients and kind of almost sticky mucus that covers basically everything in the sea and everything on the rocky shore that you can't see that limpets eat and uh, I will let you go watch the video to find out why they leave teeth marks but just think about it for a moment because this creature actually indents rock with its own teeth so that's a hint to how awesome their teeth are my first encounter with hydroids it was during um, a research project and I looked under the microscope and thought I must have done something wrong I must have stored these these creatures wrong because they can't be alive they literally just looked like ghost plants without any features at all to identify them and in fact you follow these books through the hundreds of different species of hydroids and you can actually work out ways to tell them apart. It was a mind-blowing and tedious experience. And they're but they are really cool. So hydroids act as like jellyfish. I know that doesn't make any sense, but some jellyfish have stages of their lives where they are hydroids. And if you kind of zoom in and flip them upside down, hydroids look like upside down jellyfish, but teeny weeny. And some of them that's how they you know, that's how jellyfish breed. They create hydroids, which are just little tiny baby jellyfish looking like a plant structure. And when they're ready and old enough, they kind of bud off and another one will grow. And they can even do this without, you know, reproducing with other species. Sometimes it's just one jellyfish breeding on its own to produce clones of itself. So lots of little things of the same jellyfish. I will definitely go into more detail about that in a different video because, yeah, I mean, there is a lot to be said about that weird, weird thing. Anemones are another favourite of the rocky shore because uh, they're amazing and awesome too. Uh, the beadlet anemone is a particularly great one um, in the UK. It comes in the colours of red and orange and, and brown, but red most of the time. It also has these gorgeous blue dots on them and can also have like a blue lining around it. And the blue dots are uh, kind of sacks of extra potent stinging cells because an anemone will hunt by stinging and it will also protect itself by stinging. And um, this anemone is particularly great at living on a rocky shore and especially in mid-shore because it can live both in a rock pool and out of it. When it's in a rock pool it can kind of feed more of the time because it doesn't dry out. But when it's outside of a rock pool it has to attract all its tentacles with inside itself. And it's very tempting to prod an anemone. I get the urge. But by prodding an anemone really hard, you can actually squeeze out the water that it's kind of retracted and retained with it. And that can really stress it out and not great for it when it's out of the water. So just a thing, if you can avoid prodding really hard anemones, um, that would be good for them. 
So here is the final reveal of the painting section of the Nature Journal. Here we have the final layout full of colour just like our rocky shore and of course with our lift up and rocks we can see the lovely species living on the bottom as well as our cheeky hidden edible crab and our cheeky hidden uh, common shore crab and our sea squirts under that rock. But now it's time to complete maybe the more journal aspect of the nature journal and fill it in with titles, some fun facts and some of the information that we've been talking about but on a lovely uh, journal moleskin nature page spread. Well we need a good title, I'm terrible with fonts so I gave a nice uh, midshore rock pools for, uh, words a, a, a good go. I filled it with a lot of facts or just little sentences that I'd said throughout or funny things and then wrote a Latin species list so that every species I was said was noted down and then put next to a little number that got added in pencil next to the species. Latin names are really good if you want to help people google it around the world because some places species are called the same thing but are completely different so I just kind of thought it was a nice little touch and uh, yeah 23 species we managed to include in the end. 23! pulling spread we have our rocks attached on as flaps with our edible crab hiding underneath and our common shore crab having a bit of a snooze with his eyes sticking up under the other rock we've got starfish and mussels and the world's oldest marine life and we've got the world's least oldest marine invertebrate and <laughs> we've seen ghost plants and uh, cute tiny baby snails, stars that we can't touch, evil stars. <laughs> there has been a lot in this video and I have had a blast doing it. And I am so pleased and chuffed at this sketchbook page. I think it's really come together and it's probably the best one I've done yet. Which is, you know, always the goal as we try and improve what we do, make each one better than the last. And I am pretty pleased with that. So the final species count for this journal page is 23. We managed to fit 23 species in, but there are hundreds on the rocky shore. And I'm actually gonna make sure that I do videos like this for the upper shore and the lower shore, and you know, maybe even repeat them for each of them because there's so many more species I could cram into this book. And I suppose it's why I've got the sketchbook because I can fill it all up with all of my amazing mop pooling friends. I'd like to end this video by thanking Bethan, who is running Nature Journaling Week, which is why I produced this extra video this week and kind of inspired me to come up with this great idea. It was great that she asked me and uh, thank you for sharing. That week has been amazing, so if you like Nature Journaling, 
go to her website which I will link below and check that out and although this is the last day on ecosystems I'm sure that, that all the resources that have been there are going to stay up so you can go and check that out and just see what everyone's been up to and uh nature journaling week ash the hashtag tons of art tons of great nature journals so go check that out uh, as well that's it from me everyone have a fabulous week and i'll see you next wednesday bye everyone